So have you ever wondered how you can populate your 2D action games with some random obstacles to try and avoid for the players? You know, some asteroids, for example, that fall from the top of the screen continuously and make your arcade endless 2D runner more challenging. Well, today we're going to see that in our modern game engines, that's actually quite easy to do. Hello everyone, I'm Mina, and in this new God of War c -Shop tutorial, we're going to explore how we can create random 2D obstacles at regular intervals. Ok, so first of all, we need to see how to create our asteroid at the top of the level, in random locations, like this. Our goal will be to have those obstacles pop at regular intervals, always somewhere along this horizontal top edge of the screen, and then in the next section we'll see how to have them move down towards the player. Now to handle this random spawning, we're going to use two things in our main demo scene. First, we'll have a spawn timer node. This node will call our spawning function every time it times out, and will give it slightly different countdowns each time, so that our asteroids don't pop completely like clockwork, which would feel a bit unnatural. That's why in the node inspector, we needed to make sure to auto-start the timer, but then play it only once, since we'll actually restart it manually from within our logic. Second, we'll use a path to d and path follow to d node combo. The idea here is that by defining our path as a horizontal line at the top of the screen, and then moving the path follow to d inside, we'll get random positions that are all on this line and can thus be used as spawn positions for our asteroids. To implement the spawning logic, I've put a C# -sharp script on this path follow to d node called asteroid spawner, and it works as follows. First, at the top of the script, we get some references. We have the asteroid prefab to instantiate at each spawn, the spawn timer node we saw before, and our scene root node, which we get in the ready function, because I want to add the asteroid that we spawn to this space node in the scene. Then, all we have left in the script is our actual spawning method, which don't forget is linked as a callback to the timeout signal of our spawn timer node. In this function, we start by instantiating our asteroid prefab to get a new obstacle in the scene, we add it to the base scene node, and finally we initialize it properly. This initialization consists in two parts. We start by getting a random position for path follow to d, as we discussed previously, so somewhere along our horizontal line. And then we snap our new asteroid at these global 2d coordinates. And also we call an initialize function on our asteroid that we will discuss in a minute and that basically just randomizes a bunch of stuff on the instance to create ever slightly different obstacles every time. Last but not least, we assign a new random countdown to our timer and we restart it. And so that's basically it for our main spawning logic. By the way, the asteroid prefab will instantiate looks like this. It's a simple character body 2D hierarchy with some sprite visual and something called a visible on screen notifier 2D. We'll get into all that in just a second when we talk about our asteroid logic. For now, we'll just assume that we have this prefab ready and that we can thus assign it in our path follow 2D's inspector along with the spawn timer node. So at this point, if we play our scene, we see that we do get some asteroids that appear at the top of the screen, at somewhat regular intervals, and at random positions. But of course, now we'd like those obstacles to actually move down, because right now there isn't much of a challenge. Alright, in this second part, we're going to add some movement to our asteroids so that they fall down towards the bottom edge of the screen. And then, when they reach this edge and get out of view, they'll automatically delete themselves to avoid cluttering the scene with useless off-screen notes. Ok, so as we saw previously, the root of our asteroid scene is a character body 2D node, with its associated collision shape 2D node to define the collider shape, here it's a circle. Now, we already talked about character bodies and more specifically character body 2D nodes in this previous episode of the series, so I'm not going to go into too much details here. In short, Godot's character bodies are a type of physics bodies that are not affected by forces directly, so you have to move them manually using a script, but they can affect the other bodies in their path. Here, the full logic for this asteroid, which I've put on the root node of the prefab scene in the asteroid.cs script, is the following. 
At the top, we get a list of all possible asteroid sprites in our project. This list is used in our initialize function, which you'll remember that we called earlier in our asteroid spawn script in the spawning logic. And what we want is to get a random sprite from the list, and at the same time also get a random initial rotation, a downward velocity, and a random rotation speed for this asteroid instance. Again, that's a way of adding a bit of variety. Then, the continuous rotation and the velocity are used in the physics process function to have the asteroid rotate slowly on itself and fall down according to our velocity vector thanks to the move and slide built in. Finally, at the very end of the script, we define a cleanup function that will delete this asteroid instance if it's not visible anymore. And we'll simply connect this method as a callback for the screen exited signal of our visibility notifier node over here. And here we go! If we try our game again, we see that our random asteroids now fall as soon as they pop at their random location, and then they disappear when they hit the bottom edge of the screen. By the way, as a quick improvement, it can be really cool to have the background starry sky move a bit as well. This will further increase the feel of movement. To do that, we can use a fixed image in a texture rec node, but then give this node a special canvas item shader that continuously moves its vertical UV coordinate. By enabling the repeat option on this texture, we thus get a very basic and highly controllable displacement of our background sky, although we have just one static image in our project assets. Okay, that's pretty cool. We now have a big part of our logic, and the only thing that's left to discuss is how we can detect collisions between those obstacles and our player avatar. To wrap up this tutorial, let's see how we can have this spaceship player avatar collide with the asteroid. If we take a look at what's inside this player scene, we see that it's structured as follows. The root node is a character body 2D, just like our asteroids. That's because we'll want our player avatar to be controllable via some input keys, just to move it left or right in the scene. The collision shape to the node beneath defines the shape of this body's collider as another circle, and then we have Kenny's spaceship sprite for the visual, and finally, at the bottom, we have a sub-hierarchy with an area to the node and its own collider as a child node that has the same shape as the first one. This extra area-based hierarchy is useful because we want our player to be able to detect when an asteroid gets close, so that it can react and take some damage, play some specific explosion VFX, or any other way of indicating that there's been a collision. And in Godot, area nodes are special trigger zones that can detect other physics bodies or areas that enter and exit, and can thus run specific parts of our logic thanks to precisely timed signals. Typically, in this case, we'll use the area's body entered signal to detect when other character body 2D nodes, meaning here asteroids, enter this circular zone. However, when using this player setup, it's important to ensure that the root character body 2D node is on a different physics layer and uses a different physics mask than that of the asteroids. Otherwise, the ship will basically collide and block those asteroids instead of just detecting them with the area to the node. Now, the last step is to give some logic to our player, which I've done here with a C -sharp script on the root node of this scene, aptly named player. So, inside, we're again using the physics process function to update our character body to this position thanks to the velocity and the move inside built in, except that this time, this velocity depends on the current player input. Basically, this input.getAxis method will compute a float between minus one and plus one, corresponding to the input key that is currently pressed, if any, among the two ready made Godot actions UI left and UI right that are associated with the left and right arrow keys. In short, this means that if we're pressing either the left or right key, then this float will be minus one or plus one, and so we can use it to update the horizontal component of our body's velocity. Else, if we're not pressing anything, this axis will be zero, and so in that case, we'll have our horizontal velocity quickly drop back down to zero. Finally, the area to the body entered signal is linked to this callback function at the bottom of the script, to which Godot automatically passes a reference to the 2D body node that entered the area. 
which allows us to check if the node is indeed an asteroid, here by checking if it's in a specific node group called asteroids. In a nutshell, Godot's node groups are a bit like tags in other game engines. They're user-defined collections of nodes that allow you to get or process nodes without having to know precisely what those nodes are exactly, just by considering them as part of a group. This helps increase modularity and better organize your Godot project in a clever way. Now, to actually put our obstacles in this asteroids group, we'll go back to our asteroid prefab scene, select the root node, which is the character body 2D that our player's area 2D can detect, and on the right, we'll switch over to the node panel and then the group section inside. Finally, we'll write the name of our group in the input and press enter to create the group and auto add this node to it. So from now on, whenever an asteroid enters the area 2D zone of our player avatar, this callback function will get triggered and this check will pass, meaning that the collision will be properly detected and the asteroid will be removed. We can see this by replaying our game and then moving left or right until we hit an obstacle. You see that the asteroid disappears instantly, as expected. Of course, here we've just set up a basic collision detection, and all we do when we get a contact is remove the asteroid or ships touched, which can be a bit underwhelming in an actual game. That's why in a real project, you usually add some cool effects, like an explosion and some screen shake. I don't want to dive into this today, cause this episode is already a bit long, but of course, if you're curious about those extra features, let me know down below in the comments. But in any case, here you go. You now know how to create random 2D obstacles in a Godot scene, have them fall at a given speed, and even check for collisions with your player spaceship. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of Godot tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching and take care.